This is ComNet. The mission of the Public Health Service Commission Corps is to provide highly trained mobile health professionals that promote the health of the nation. David Clue visited with members of the Commission Corps to talk about how they're used in the recovery effort. The Office for Domestic Preparedness prepares America's emergency responders through training designed to meet the needs of state and local communities. Diane Roberts looks at the new initiatives in the Office for Domestic Preparedness training programs. ComNet continues its series on the Citizen Corps programs by highlighting the Neighborhood Watch. Stacy Phillips spoke with members of Neighborhood Watch about how private citizens can play a crucial role in the detection and prevention of terrorist acts. The Texas Engineering Extension Services National Emergency Response and Rescue Training Center offers a course that trains emergency response supervisors and managers. John Eastman visited the Teeks course and shows how it can help develop the skills necessary to effectively manage a terrorist incident. ComNet is sponsored by the Department of Homeland Security, Office for Domestic Preparedness, and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Coming to you from the facilities of the National Terrorism Preparedness Institute at St. Petersburg College, here are Al Rochelle and Jennifer Holloway. Hello and welcome to ComNet, the communications, news, equipment, and training magazine. This program presents weapons of mass destruction related awareness information to the nation's civilian and military response communities. Now, ComNet is being distributed over government and commercial information networks. It's also being streamed over the World Wide Web at terrorism.spcollege.edu. Now, we invite you to visit the NTPI website for further details on the information provided during today's program. Continuing education units can be earned for viewing ComNet programs. To register for those CEUs, go to the NTPI website and click on the Continuing Education Units link under Training. This link will take you through the registration process and the login process. Now, after you log in, you'll be able to view program videos, take the program exam, and fill out an evaluation form. With an exam grade of 75% or better, you will immediately receive an online CEU certificate. Now, after viewing ComNet, please complete a viewer evaluation of that program. Your input and comments are very important to us. The Office for Domestic Preparedness is a principal component of the Department of Homeland Security. Its job is to prepare the U.S. for all types of disasters. To that end, training, funding, and support are critical to satisfying the mission. Diane Roberts tells us what is available now and what's on the horizon to make responders ready. The Office for Domestic Preparedness is the primary executive agent for Homeland Security Presidential Directive 8, which focuses on national preparedness. Barbara Bean, acting director of ODP's training division, tells us the goal is to define a common approach to national preparedness in the area of incident management, national response, and infrastructure protection. She says we must be able to answer questions like, how well are we prepared, and prepared for what? These scenes are real-life examples of how terrorism could or does affect the public, and they show the need for cooperative training. Barbara Bean will help us give you a better understanding of what you need to know about co-op. Let's start with the NRP. It has seven overreaching priorities. Three are broader in scope. In order to function effectively together, we essentially all have to be working off of the same playbook. And that really is what the National Response Plan is. It's very much predicated on the precepts of the incident command system. But the National Response Plan and the National Incident Management System help from a response aspect in terms of figuring out where which piece fits and how everybody plays together. So those are the larger pieces of it. And then you come down to four that are more capability specific, things that are more related along the lines of um, intelligence in terms of interoperable communications, in terms of uh, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear uh, detection and response and uh, remediation type of issues, as well as medical prophylaxis and medical surge. So basically what we do is we take a look at our programs and see how they match and align to those priorities and see, again, related to the target capabilities that are being developed under 
under Homeland Security Presidential Directive 8 to see what coverage of those target capabilities and those prioritized capabilities we have. Talk about the uh, Cooperative Training Outreach Program. What exactly is that? What do you hope to get out of that for the first responders? The co-op program for us is where we're taking our existing Train the Trainer programs and structuring those in training support packages so that state and local institutions, the state administering agencies, can designate existing institutions that are within their, uh, within their state and have those already qualified institutions take that curriculum in and teach it to their own folks. It's essentially a, a variation on the parable of, of having folks fish for themselves. Um, and that leaves us essentially able to use our resources to be able to support that high dollar um, specialized facility training, things that really maybe can't necessarily be done at the state and local level, and, and again provides the state and local capacity to be able to not only do that initial training, but to have that sustainment training as you deal with turnover concerns and as you deal with refresher concerns. The Cooperative Training Outreach Program will be implemented in three phases. Phase one in the first quarter of the fiscal year 06. State administering agencies will designate organizations within their state, territories, or tribal entities to adopt and deliver the standardized training programs that should ensure quality and consistency. Phase two happens in the second quarter. It will enable the electronic system to catch up to the mission. By then, SAAs and training points of contact will receive an electronic toolkit. And by the third quarter, phase three will see the program institutionalized. Let's take a quick look at each phase. The first phase for us is, uh, again, working with the state administering agencies to uh, help them designate organizations within their state to take these programs in and to deliver them. Phase two, we're optimizing, we're making sure that those systems are in place, that we're providing those uh, materials to them, and that basically will allow those master trainers, the people that have been designated as the keepers of the program within that institution, to download and have all the most current material in terms of making sure that they have the most current version of items. Phase three, we're going to be expanding the number of courses that are available. We're going to be working with the states and the master trainers to look at the evaluative data that comes back from those, uh, from those courses. Let's talk about some of the specifics, uh, the training grant fiscal year 04, food and agricultural safety and defense. Talk a little bit about what that entails. Food and agriculture safety is obviously a, a significant concern, uh, not only monetarily, but also for uh, just core security issues. And we work closely with uh, our partner agency, the USDA, on this and their Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. We have co cooperatively with them designed a curriculum that's delivered through our Center for Domestic Preparedness in Anniston that's called an Agriculture Emergency Response Training Course. It's a three-day course two days of which is uh, core instruction in terms of items such as the threat itself, proper donning and doffing of personal protective equipment, as well as decontamination. Uh, also, on the third day, then the students go into a practical exercise in terms of dealing with a suspect incident, a suspect um, animal incident. Um, we also have additional courses that are under development based on our competitive training grant program from last year. Uh, Agroterrorism, as you mentioned, is a complex arena because you have not only uh, food and uh, food from that perspective, you also have food and animal, it's uh, plant and animal, pre-production, post-production, so you have everything from security uh, aspects of crops being grown to those crops being harvested and trucked somewhere for production. Uh, so there's a, a many variables in the system and that's why we work very closely with our colleagues at USDA. It sounds like a real effort on, in prevention, focusing on prevention. Yes, very much so. As the saying goes, a prevention is really worth a pound of cure. So anything that we can do with respect to prevention and early detection uh, is really a lot of the focus of the effort. What we can do with respect to uh, spotting anything that might be suspicious in a crop or spotting surveillance of, uh, of a production facility. You really never know what piece of information you may be denying someone that could prevent a successful attack. And so that prevention concept really is key, especially in the agroterrorism area. Let's talk a little bit about transportation then. What kind of training is developed in that area and why is it even important? One of the uh, awards that we had out of our competitive program for last year was, again, training for non-sworn 
professionals that are providing security in the public safety arena. And this is a project that's uh, being conducted to the Los Angeles County Metropolitan uh, Transit um, Authority. And basically what they're doing is working together with, uh, with their core group to provide that training that's really needed in terms of the non-sworn professional. So it's not a sworn law enforcement official, but it's somebody that's responsible within the transit system, whether it's a security guard, um, whether it's a monitor, it's somebody that's really responsible within that system for assuring the safety of the passengers and the security and availability of the system itself. The other component there is that you're also dealing with threats from the explosive side. So we also have established curriculum through, uh, through our partner out at the New Mexico Tech, the uh, New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology with respect to incident response to terrorist bombings and, and prevention and response to suicide bombing incidents. So detecting which uh, suspicious characteristics are out there, detecting and disrupting that planning loop, uh, recognizing the difference between a letter bomb, a package bomb, a potential vehicle bomb, and uh, being able to, again, put some of those pieces together. And in this day and age, if you don't know about the internet, don't know how to use the internet, you cannot be the best you can be. So I'm interested to know about FirstRespondertraining.gov. What is it? I'm excited about this project. It's a first responder training portal. What we're doing with FirstRespondertraining.gov is essentially trying to prevent that problem that happens to us in, in so many ways in different areas of our lives where sometimes you feel like you have to know the right answer to be able to ask the right question to get the right answer. So what we're looking to do because we have evolved as an organization and we have 45 training partners and we have a myriad of programs available is looking to provide a, a good entrance to the shopping mall of possibilities, if you will. Right now, the program is in a pilot mode. Uh, we began in mid-August in a pilot with uh, 10 states and, uh, and a territory. And basically what we're doing is where uh, each state, as you might imagine, has its own structures for how it approves people to go to training. And so we're working with those uh, groups and individuals to make sure that we've captured that. When will it actually be launched for people to use on a regular basis. The state administering agents and all of the folks that we deal with at the state level will be able to uh, have the access that they need to do their functions with us uh, again first quarter of 06. So we're looking to roll that out in conjunction with the uh, FY06 grant guidance. When you look at the future of ODP training, what do you see? Short term for us, our big focus is to make a very tight connection between training and exercises, um, to make sure that, that, that we really do a good job closing the loop between the lessons we learned so that we don't end up uh, having people drive through what I call someone else's pothole, um, that they find their very own, uh, and that we progressively patch those so that hopefully the road becomes very much smoother. Um, in terms of going forward from there, we're also very much looking at uh, simulation application of technologies in, in that sense. Um, we're very much again focused on that institutionalization concept in terms of making sure that state and locals can do as much as they can at their home jurisdiction. Bean is well aware the response community is faced with many difficult situations and challenges. The Cooperative Training Outreach Program is designed to help responders juggle them all with the ultimate goal of protecting their community and themselves safely. If you'd like more information on the Cooperative Training Outreach Program and how it can help it expand first responder preparedness training all across the country, just visit the NTPI website. Now let's take a look at what's coming up on the next Live Response. Through preparation and coordination, local first response personnel can effectively respond to a public health crisis. On the next Live Response, we'll look at the Metropolitan Medical Response System and show how it supports existing emergency preparedness plans. Live Response airs Wednesday, January 25th at 2 p.m. Eastern. For more information on viewing, make sure to register online at terrorism.spcollege.edu. With the new challenges that law enforcement agencies face today, it's important that citizens get involved in their own preparedness for emergencies, disasters, 
And now, terrorism. Stacey Phillips continues her review of the Citizen Corps with a look at the Neighborhood Watch program. Perhaps one of the oldest and most well-known initiatives from the National Sheriff's Association in partnership with Citizen Corps and U.S. Department of Justice is the Neighborhood Watch program. And at the forefront of Neighborhood Watch is the goal of establishing relationships between citizens and law enforcement. Crime prevention can't just be done completely by the police or by the sheriffs. There has to be engagement with the community and, and involvement with the citizens. And, and Neighborhood Watch um, provides that program to promote that, that engagement um, of the citizens because it has to be a partnership to truly fight crime effectively. It can't just all be by the police or by the sheriffs. It has to be with the involvement of the local community and the local neighborhood. It, it needs to be a partnership of the local community and the local law enforcement agency. They have to work together to make it work and make it happen. Most law enforcement officers know that they get a lot more cases solved by information from the community. And so it makes their job much easier. Neighborhood Watch has been a mainstay in crime prevention for many years. Uh, it had uh, started with the National Sheriff's Association in 1972 uh, as we saw crime rates increasing, the recognition that citizens could play a role. Uh, even through the advent of community policing in the 90s, uh, it has been very, very popular. As, uh, as we've seen the reduction at a 30-year low right now in, in, in crimes across the country, Neighborhood Watch has played a, a significant role over the years in that concept, in the idea that we've been able to reduce crime by uh, developing a partnership with citizens. So within BJA, it fits into our law enforcement section, our policy uh, shop, that looks at both crime prevention and law enforcement initiatives and community initiatives. How does the Neighborhood Watch Group benefit local law enforcement, whether it's the Sheriff's Department or the Police Departments? Well, in, in many ways, it, it certainly it acts as a conduit for the local law enforcement into the communities and into the, uh, the local neighborhoods. And it, it's a great benefit in that, again, it fosters a partnership, it fosters a working relationship, it opens communications uh, between local law enforcement and the citizens that they serve. And together, forming that partnership to affect uh, uh, crime positively and a reduction in crime and to also uh, go into other areas such as uh, disaster response and homeland security on a local level. When you capture that spirit and the partnership between citizens and police, we have a, a strong need in this country to have, have public safety. Citizens um, have a right to be crime free, uh, have a right not to be victimized. And so when you look at Neighborhood Watch as one strong and key element in keeping citizens safe, that's the number one program that, that a law enforcement agency will have to provide citizen safety. And so it's going to be around for a, a very, very long time. Through these relationships or partnerships, the original purpose of Neighborhood Watch was to reduce residential crime. However, with the events of 9-11, Neighborhood Watch is now being revitalized with additional prevention activities. I think there's been enough proof in this country after September 11th when we had this terrorist living amongst us and how sad that we didn't know enough or weren't involved enough to look at those suspicious activities. And I think that we will never be the same in this country from now on. We're just going to have to be on the lookout, be aware. There's our responsibility that we never have another September 11th. If someone says, can a terrorism attack take place in my neighborhood? The answer is yes. Uh, we don't know where the next one is going to be. Um, a lot of neighbors uh, can get together and look around in their neighborhood and find out why a terrorist would come. Do I have a chemical plant? Uh, do I have a police station? Do I have a sheriff's department? Is there something in my neighborhood that's going to attract somebody to come in? Um, if there is, people need to take steps of what's going to happen. Uh, what resources do we have? That can only take place if you're meeting with people face to face and you discuss these kind of ideas. Part of the president's initiative um, that he initiated uh, several years ago is to revitalize the neighborhood watch programs. Um, and to revitalize them with additional uh, duties or, or, or additional things to concentrate on. Um, in other words, Neighborhood Watch 
can and should go beyond uh, strictly crime prevention and again uh, look at and deal with issues on the local level of how to prepare for a disaster. Tower Katrina was probably the worst hurricane that's ever hit the United States, uh, much, much worse than Camille. Um, Jackson is three hours from the coast, therefore we got a lot of evacuees and our neighborhood watch groups geared up and they came, they volunteered at the um, at the centers, we needed blood donated. We got over 200 people donating blood. It was totally amazing. Neighborhood Watch is very simple. You're just being the eyes and ears of your community. You're looking out for suspicious activities. You know, why is there a car parked in front of Mrs. Jones? Uh, why did this car drive down the street 10 times? Neighborhood Watch is knowing what is going on. Nobody's asking you to to, to um, go after anybody, chase anybody. Neighborhood Watch is, is just knowing your neighborhood, just like it was, you know, before there was air conditioning. Everybody used to hang out on their porch and know everybody that came by. We don't do that anymore. Neighborhood Watch is bringing that back to the forefront of this country. With the revitalization of the Neighborhood Watch program, the National Sheriff's Association, in partnership with the Bureau of Justice Assistance, launched USA on Watch in an effort to meet the president's goal of doubling the number of current watch groups. USA on Watch not only offers information about Neighborhood Watch, but serves as a valuable resource for those who want to start a Neighborhood Watch group. USA on Watch program is the national initiative for Neighborhood Watch, to really promote Neighborhood Watch to local communities, to really engage agencies where Neighborhood Watch has not begun to get them started. Uh, there's over 15,000 registered Neighborhood Watch programs in this country. 2,000 law enforcement agencies have uh, signed up and said, yes, we're running a Neighborhood Watch. And that's just those that have signed up. So we're constantly trying to get them registered so that we can provide better service, better training, um, exchange information more readily uh, to them on a regular basis. At a national level, uh, the USA on Watch program uh, can furnish not only information, but also can direct you, uh, you know, as far as where you can uh, get materials, uh, you know, who, who you can call. And that's what's so great about having uh, the, the USA on Watch is because they're like the national clearing. They can be the source for, no matter where you live in the country. There is no excuse. If you, you know, really want to develop a neighborhood watch and you really don't know, just, you know, uh, contact uh, the, the USA on Watch and they can help you with that. They can pull up information on how to start a new neighborhood watch program, how to go about revitalizing it. Um, they can do such things as you can plug in your zip code and find out by putting in a zip code what, what's your local uh, law enforcement agency, who, who to contact. Um, to find out if there is a Neighborhood Watch program there um, or if a new one needs to be started. Through the website of USA on Watch, it provides a link um, to Neighborhood Watch programs, a link to what's going on in your community as it relates to Neighborhood Watch, and also gives those people the ability to um, link in to other partners under the uh, Citizen Corps program. It allows uh people who have registered to get a monthly issue of, of things that, that happen throughout the United States. In essence, uh, the president's speech is on the website. Uh, when someone mentions Neighborhood Watch and we have a success story, it's on the website. Uh, these are, these are uh, points that can be taken and applied back to where you live. It also uh, gives us a, an advantage to, to let us know that you're out there. Um, it also gives you the ability to tell us that you've got a problem in a particular area. And so again, it, it, it's a help to everybody, uh, big or small. And uh, by registering, you let us know you're out there. By telling us what you need, uh, it gives us an opportunity to help. If you want to register on, uh, for Neighborhood Watch, you can register your Neighborhood Watch at usaonwatch.org. Another helpful resource to both citizens and law enforcement agencies is currently under development by USA on Watch, the Neighborhood Watch Toolkit. Uh, the Neighborhood Watch Toolkit is a uh, development piece that we have right now that we'll be putting out uh, in, the, in the next year to law enforcement. It, uh, it contains uh, 
the starting elements of a neighborhood watch. In essence, how do you run a meeting? Uh, it has a phone tree. It has an agenda, sample agenda. It has a uh, composition board that, that shows where you start and where you want to finish. Uh, it has uh, various flip charts and uh, flip books that are only this big. So in essence, it's a cheat sheet, sheet that you can look at. In that kit are observation skills. Um, what am I looking for? I see something go by, am I what am I looking at? Uh, what do I need to, to make note of when I'm on a, out on neighborhood watch? Uh, so again, we, we start from the beginning and we give them those, those basic skills. Uh, also included in, in, the, uh, in the kit are, is a uh, participant guide that, that takes you through all the, all the CDs, et cetera, et cetera. Now, these kits will be handed out as we go across the country uh, with the, the 15 training sites that we'll be picking up regionally now over the next year. Uh, those people that attend those trainings will be given a, uh, a neighborhood watch kit. What we have found is it's typically it's easy to get a neighborhood watch group started when there's been a problem in the community. The key is keeping it sustained. And that's one of the reasons we, we're coming out with a new toolkit with the community presentations on a CD. So it gives the officer something to keep going with. And what we're doing is trying to encourage the neighborhood watch groups to kind of pick something and work on that and not just let the meetings drop. You know, neighborhood watch could be 10 houses, one block. Neighborhood watch can be a whole community. A gated community of 300 people can become uh, a neighborhood watch. Anybody that wants to resolve, be either proactive or reactive, you know, can start a neighborhood watch. You just need to do it. What is the future of neighborhood watch? Uh, the future is unlimited. As long as we market correctly, as long as we train correctly, and as long as we, uh, we keep it in the public eye, we can take neighborhood watch as high as it can go. If you feel safe in your community, you have to be part of the solution. So if you see crime, you need to report it. You need to participate in Neighborhood Watch. If there isn't one in your neighborhood, call the local law enforcement agency. Get on, on the website and go to USA on Watch. Get involved, participate, show that volunteer spirit by helping to keep these communities crime free. With citizens and law enforcement working together, the Neighborhood Watch program is helping to create a safe and secure nation, one neighborhood at a time. And now let's take a look at this month's Responder News. The destruction caused by natural disasters requires recovery efforts that are sometimes as dangerous as the initial event. The Department of Labor's Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, hopes accessible education will help keep workers from becoming post-incident victims. OSHA has developed eight quick cards and more than 30 fact sheets aimed at helping employers and their employees address the health and safety hazards associated with hurricane recovery. Work zone traffic safety, mold, and general decontamination are among the topics covered. The four by nine inch cards are being distributed to Gulf Coast relief workers. The laminated two-sided cards currently feature concise directions and tips in English and Spanish. With Vietnamese cards already in production, OSHA plans to add other languages and additional topics depending on demand. Vehicle crashes are the leading cause of on-duty volunteer firefighter deaths. The National Volunteer Fire Council, under the direction of the United States Fire Administration, has created a new internet-based program for emergency vehicle safe operations. The web-based educational program features 10 key practices designed to help manage risk. The program is part of the Emergency Vehicle Safety Best Practices Self-Assessment that also includes downloadable charts that enable first responders to easily monitor their agency's progress. In addition, site visitors can learn about behavior management and motivation, critical safety issues of volunteer firefighter safety, and standard operating procedures for more than 20 different vehicle-related tasks. The program also supports the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation Firefighter Life Safety Initiative to reduce on-duty firefighter fatalities. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency recently established the Center for Advancing Microbial Risk Assessment, or CAMRA, to support homeland security objectives. By filling critical gaps in microbial risk assessment, CAMRA, located at Michigan State University, will arm first responders and policymakers with the information they need for protection against biological threats. 
The center's two main objectives are to develop models and information that can reduce the health impacts from biological threats and to build a national network for information transfer about microbial risk assessment. Most of New Orleans is still struggling to recover from Hurricane Katrina and the floods that came in its wake. Some residents, however, have returned to work thanks to some non-traditional housing. John McQuiston has the story. Work at St. Bernard Port near New Orleans has resumed because workers displaced by Hurricane Katrina have found temporary housing close by. They're living on travel trailers parked aboard the motor vessel Cape Vincent. And we're broken out for uh, any kind of emergency. Some of it is uh, relief type efforts like back in Somalia and Haiti and whatnot or Katrina now. Other times it's for various logistical uh, wartime efforts such as in, uh, in Iraq, etc. We've been over there half a dozen times. Captain David Scott has steered the 632-foot-long merchant marine ship to ports all over the world. But this mission is much different. So is it used for things like housing extra people? Not normally. This is a special one-time modification. Usually we're carrying various roll-on, roll-off vehicles, um, you know, Humvees and tanker trucks and, uh, and you know, military-type vehicles primarily. Those vehicles don't usually have people living in them. So the Cape Vincent had to be modified to accommodate the 18 trailers and the roughly 60 workers who are living inside them. Well, it was really fairly major because we don't have the, uh, the sanitation device capacity, so we had to add a, uh, a, a rather large sanitation device in order to allow for that and uh, had to add uh, piping for potable water and uh, electrical connections, etc., in order to enable all this to work. And also washers and dryers and, and figure out how we're going to feed that many people within our uh, fairly limited galley space. But the work on this ship was necessary so that work at the port could resume. Work here had stopped after the hurricane. Even when its equipment was ready, the port still could not open because its workers had evacuated the area. A lot of the workers had found temporary housing, but it was as far as four hours away from here, and that made it impossible to get here to work. Now they live right here. It's going real well so far. Um, the stevedores here have been really good to work with, and their people are kind of used to being on ships a bit, so uh, it's worked out pretty well. But Captain Scott understands if his guests don't want to stay here any longer than they have to. Most of St. Bernard Parish still does not have essential services. For now, it is the Cape Vincent that allows the port to service other ships. So they have like 60 guys doing 12-hour shifts now, being able to get back in business and get things started. And meanwhile, you're gradually starting to see electricity and whatnot pop up. So whenever they can move back, I know they'll be happy to move back, probably up between a month or two. This is John McQuist. A biohazard detection system is scheduled to be fully installed this month at 282 mail processing facilities. The completed system utilizes existing technologies to allow the United States Postal Service to test for anthrax. More than 27 billion pieces of mail have been screened without a single false positive at the sites where installation has been completed. Northrop Grumman is responsible for maintaining the 1,373 systems it developed along with Postal Service engineers and the U.S. Army. Postal workers will have no interaction with this system other than replacing the cartridges that collect samples. Each biohazard detection system costs $250,000 and is the result of planning that began immediately after the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. I'm Jenny Dean, and that's a look at this month's Responder News. When public health safety is put on the line, the United States Public Health Service is responsible for furnishing health expertise in these times of crisis. David Clue looks at how the Commissioned Corps can help. When the medical community is simply overwhelmed by a natural or man-made disaster, what is needed is a single group that can combine the resources of the federal government the organization of the U.S. military, and the critical skills of the medical community. What is needed is the commissioned corps. The commissioned corps is a branch of the uniformed services that is committed to protecting the health of the nation. It is commanded by the Surgeon General 
and the soldiers of the United States Commission Corps are assigned to a variety of operating divisions or agencies within the Department of Health and Human Services. Priorities at the Commission Corps are first to protect and advance the health of the nation. And we do that through prevention programs, where everything from preventing the catastrophes that could occur from hurricanes and tornadoes, uh, spread of disease, pandemic flu, all of those things. So prevention is first, but when we can't prevent or there are unanticipated challenges, we are prepared to respond, to mitigate, and then help people recover from whatever the event is. The Commission Corps is composed of a wide range of health professionals, certainly physicians, nurses, dentists, pharmacists, the ones you might think of right up front, but certainly it involves a whole range of other skill sets from optometry to physical therapy to veterinary skills. And in general, in order to become a member of the Commission Corps, you have to have a professional or advanced degree in a health, a health arena. When there is a natural disaster or a urgent public health need or a national special security event, then emergency support function eight is normally activated under the national response plan. And the first asset that generally is utilized by ESF-8 is the Commission Corps of the Public Health Service. The Office of Force Readiness and Deployment has such a critical role in our ability to do our job out here. Uh, they don't get sort of the feeling that we do of gratification of working with the folks here on the ground. They don't get the, uh, the good vibes of seeing a patient and watching them walk out feeling better and so on. But they are so critically important because those folks are the people who provide us with our staff. They do that by having a, a listing of who the officers are, what their skill sets are, uh, what their readiness is. They have that full roster. They make the connections and draw down the officers from their usual workplaces and then uh, provide them to us when we call them down. When a natural or man-made disaster destroys a community, it's the Commission Corps working with many other agencies that helps bring the medical community back to its feet. The Department of Defense, the Veterans Administration, NDMS, and the U.S. Public Health Service are partners. And then we have other support from the American Red Cross and Department of Transportation and, and other federal departments as needed. The Corps, while uh, making wonderful contributions, for instance, does not have the logistical capacity of the Department of Defense. We don't have the hospital bed capacity of the VA and the DOD and their partner hospitals. Uh, we don't have the, uh, the EMT capacity, uh, the emergency medical technician capacity of the National Disaster Medical System. So we all build on each other's strengths and fill in the gaps where we have weaknesses. How should states and first responders view the Commission Corps when they begin to show up after being called up? The uh, Commission Corps officers know that when they show up, they are simply the technical assistants, they're the advisors, they're the augmentees for the existing local and state resources. We pride ourselves on being able to fill the gaps that are necessary when the resources of a community are exceeded, but we also recognize that local and state control is paramount and that we serve at the pleasure of the leaders there. Here in Cameron Parish, Louisiana, Hurricane Katrina not only paralyzed the medical community, it destroyed it. And when you lose an entire hospital like this one, it means you have to recreate a medical infrastructure in a hurry. It is one of the Commission Corps' first priorities. This was such an overwhelming event that you didn't know where to begin, quite honestly. The hospitals were gone, the primary care infrastructures were gone, the public health systems were gone and working with the uh, state to basically say, well, where do we begin to, to eat this elephant, uh, as it were, was a, was a big challenge. Well, we're still here because in this particular parish, we are the only game in town still. A lot of this, lot of this parish, the local medical infrastructure was destroyed, and so the only thing we have available to us here in this, in this area is a field set up for us to operate out of. So that's why we're still here, because there is no local medical infrastructure that is prepared yet to come back in and, and transition us out. Talk to me about a little bit about the work that's going on uh, in, in an incident like Katrina. What is the Commission Corps charged with doing, and uh, how, do we, how do we see whether or not they're uh, completing that mission? Most of what we're doing within the Katrina Reader response is defined in ESF-8 in the National Response Plan, which is uh, the medical and public health needs of a community. We have our public health people embedded within the public health departments to make sure that public health is practiced, that water is safe, that sanitation, that food is safe. 
and we also provide clinical care across a, a wide range of specialties where it's needed. What we're doing now, I think normally the health department would do, but or the health unit for the parish, but they have a certain amount of people, and actually for this parish, there's only one or two people, and so they're they're swamped with work, so we're here to aid this parish and, and the parish just north of here in Calcasieu as well. Here today, we're evaluating the school for um, the damage that has been done and making sure that it's ready to be inhabited by the, the students. I think they're going to try to open on Monday. And we're also doing a full um, inspection of the cafeteria and the food service areas to make sure that's safe to, to get restock their foods and to get going again. Coming here to Katrina, it was about the mission of helping the people of Louisiana to stand back up. Tremendous amount of chaos, loss of control, infrastructure, 50% of the tax base gone. Nine out of 10 hospitals in New Orleans drowned. The mission was how do we help those people stand back up after that kind of event so that they can achieve a measure of self-control and the opportunity to provide the services that their people really need, and they needed the help. I've been in the service for 26 years. I've worked with a lot of officers, and, and many in disasters, but never in a situation that was quite as challenging, I think, and demanding of people to stay focused, stay mission driven, and step up to the plate to get the job done. I've been very, very proud of my uh, colleagues here. The role of the Commission Corps doesn't stop at basic medical services and reorganization. In fact, tens of thousands of school children were displaced by Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, all of them in potential need of mental health services. Enter the Commission Corps. Well, when you think about the impact on that population, many of them losing everything they've got in the world, uh, many of them not having much to begin with, having to leave everything they've known, their, their homes, their families, their jobs, their communities, um, and all there is is perhaps a concrete slab to go back to. Um, the mental health problems are, are huge. And so with the support of the Louisiana Department of Education, we put together a plan so that those school teachers and other uh, professionals that came in contact with these kids every day could identify problems and, and hopefully uh, uh, save the mental health of, of these kids. Commission Corps doesn't just respond to major disasters. There are things out there that you respond to that we might not think would be something that you would. We not only deploy to all sorts of disasters, but also deploy to urgent public health needs and to national special security events. Uh, a NSSE is an event that is uh, of high profile. Uh, there's going to be a lot of public attention there. Many times there are, there are lots of uh, political leaders at the event. For instance, the presidential inauguration, the State of the Union address, uh, meetings of the World Bank IMF, some meetings of the United Nations, uh, the political conventions, uh, the Olympics, uh, those kinds of venues where there's much attention, we are there to provide uh, uh, health care, to provide epidemiology support, uh, to be there in case of a weapons of mass destruction event. One of the things I'm trying to do is get the word out on the Hill and to the American public about this vital resource, which is the backbone of federal public health throughout the United States and now globally, because we deploy around the world in 800 locations, assisting other nations as well. Tell me what the future holds for the Corps. Where do you see this uh, organization? I think the future for the Corps is very bright. Never before have the demands uh, been placed on the Corps as they are today. Uh, everything from dealing with uh, terrorism, uh, weapons of mass destruction, the tools of the terrorists, natural and man-made disasters, pandemic flus, uh, emerging infections, just about any and every public health challenge and safety and security challenge within the United States, the public health has some role in either preventing, responding to, mitigating, or recovering from. If you're interested in the Commission Corps, there are plenty of places for you to work. Whatever your expertise is, if you qualify as a, and can get a commission as a Commission Corps officer, there's a place for you uh, in an agency, in a field that you'd like to work in. Both at home and abroad, it may be one of the most effective medical emergency response operations ever assembled by the federal government. The Commission Corps, protecting, promoting, and advancing the health and safety of the nation.
If you'd like more information on the Commission Corps and how it supports the medical community during an emergency, be sure and visit the NTPI website. Now let's take a look at our calendar of events. The National Sheriff's Association is sponsoring the 2006 Midwinter Conference on January 4th through 7th at the Desert Springs Marriott Resort and Spa in Palm Springs, California. On January 8th through 12th, the American Association of Airport Executives will conduct the 2006 Aviation Issues Conference at the Hapuna Beach Prince Hotel in Kona, Hawaii. And on January 16th through 21st, the American Society of Law Enforcement Trainers will conduct the 19th Annual Training Seminar and Law Enforcement Exposition in Albuquerque, New Mexico at the Albuquerque Convention Center. Then on February 7th through 9th, the 7th Annual Aviation Security Summit and Expo will be held in Washington, D.C. at the Four Point Sheridan. The National Emergency Management Association will conduct its 2006 Mid-Year Conference on February 11th through 15th at the Alexandria Mark Center in Alexandria, Virginia. On February 13th and 14th, Ohio University and Robinson Aviation will sponsor the Airport Security Planning Course at the Midwest Hotel and Conference Center in Columbus, Ohio. Then on February 15th through 17th, the fifth annual Critical Infrastructure Resilience and Infrastructure Security for the Built Environment Congress and Expo will be conducted at the Washington Convention Center in Washington, D.C. And on February 16th and 17th, the Infrastructure Security Partnership will conduct the fifth Global Homeland Security Conference and Expo, protecting the nation's critical infrastructure and key assets in Washington, D.C. at the Washington Convention Center. The Texas Engineering Extension Service National Emergency Response and Rescue Training Center has a course available that trains emergency response supervisors in managing a WMD terrorism incident. In this next story, John Eastman reports on the Incident Management and Unified Command for WMD Terrorism Incidents course and looks at how it applies the all hazards command system found in the National Incident Management System. Good morning, everybody. On the surface, the students in this class don't seem to have a lot in common. They all come from diverse fields, such as transportation, fire, police, public works, public health, government personnel, and even nonprofit agencies. What unites them is the course topic incident management and unified command for terrorism incidents. We want to have a better understanding of what um, is involved in that, and we want to be more prepared to work with the our partners that we need to in a disaster. And I thought, you know, we're, I consider to be a prime spot for an incident, that, that a potential incident could happen. And um, I just felt that it would be important for uh, myself and maybe some of our other people to be trained in this, in this type of a uh, field. Public Works has always traditionally uh, been a first responder to uh, incidents such as uh, emergencies that deal with water utilities, infrastructure, and so forth. And uh, it's really important that uh, the managers and the supervisors know how to manage those incidents and uh, use their resources. Police officers do police work, public works, build and maintain infrastructure. But the dependency on each other and from agency to agency is extremely important. And this is something that we're all learning, and, and it's kind of a new thing to a lot of us. The uh, overall goal and objective of the course is to take a group of individuals and give them the tools to plan for, respond to, and manage a multi-agency, multidisciplinary incident according to national standards. The Texas Engineering Extension Service, or TEKS, created the course under direction from the Office for Domestic Preparedness. The TEKS training course is a planning and management level course, MGT 313, from the ODP Weapons of Mass Destruction Training Program course catalog. Well, we at the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council worked to contact uh, the Texas Engineering Extension Service from Texas A&M University. Uh, through FEMA's Emergency Management Institute using their course catalog to determine which classes might benefit the first responders in the Tampa Bay region. Um, so we coordinated with TEKS and also the uh, State Training Office in Tallahassee at the Department of Community Affairs to, to coordinate the training and, and bring it down to the first responders here in this region. The National Incident Management System 
drives our course. The Office of Domestic Preparedness, or ODP, provides us with the funding to go out and put this course on. And we have recently rewritten the course within the last few months to make it NIMS compliant. ODP pays for the course. However, applicants do have to meet some basic criteria. Participants need to work at a management level within their organization. They should have also completed a weapons of mass destruction or terrorism awareness course. Well, the class is delivered at the management level. We don't consider ourselves instructors, we consider ourselves facilitators. And much of the class's success comes from the fact that the students come with a high level of expertise and they teach each other. Sometimes we leave the class learning more from the participants than the participants learn from us. That diversity of backgrounds and real-world experience is crucial when it comes time to discuss NIMS. We give them tools to plan for an incident. We give them the tools to respond to an incident. And most importantly, we give them a management tool, the incident command system, uh, under NIMS in which to mitigate an incident in the safest possible manner. One of the course objectives is to identify the most commonly encountered WMD components and apply appropriate emergency response strategies. Here's how the lesson is demonstrated. Just moments ago, a videotape was delivered by an unknown source to KRKD studio. Now, the footage you're about to see is disturbing. Um, it is the explosion that occurred earlier this morning. In a simulated newscast, students are informed that there's been an explosion at City Hall. Students are also told that the Emergency Operations Center, or EOC, is located in City Hall. Think about your structure. What are you going to do now? The hands-on exercises are a hallmark of this course. At this point, students have the knowledge, but now they're being asked to work together in realistic scenarios that will put that knowledge to the test. And what is the FBI going to do? They're going to come in and they're going to take the lead. It's an application process. We provide them with information, we show them how to use that information, and then they apply it in uh, simulated scenarios that we have pre-designed for the class. Another objective is to ensure that the local emergency management organizations are able to work with both state and federal agencies. Judging from the response, students are getting the message. Now, when they first get there, what type of structure are they going to set up? A JOC, which is a what? A Joint Operations Center. Once the class is over, these students should be able to describe their organization's role in the Incident Command System, ICS, and operate within a unified command structure during a WMD terrorism incident. It was very important to me to learn how to do the incident command, set up the unified command, and uh, learn to work with so many different enti entities and uh, people from actually outside your community who could, call, who could be called in to uh, give you help. They should be able to develop effective response strategies that integrate the full spectrum of capabilities with their community's response organizations. It's very important because as a lieutenant I respond to you know, incidents that require organization and um, control of the uh, personnel that show up and uh, this course gives me a, a better knowledge of how to organize an event and uh, the resources that I need to, to call upon. Students will also be able to examine and analyze the actions taken by various emergency response organizations during actual WMD terrorism incidents to assess the effectiveness of those actions and apply those lessons learned in their own communities. I have an expectation that they'll walk away with a different way to look at how they do their jobs. Judging from student feedback, that expectation is being met. I think the big thing for us is to learn the vocabulary so that we're all talking about the same thing and that we have some understanding of what the availability and the time frame of other resources that come into the county uh, in the area, the two counties, to help us. I think uh, that it's important for other agencies to understand what we have to offer as, as a public works entity and uh, how we can help with what, what it is that they need to do their job. Many key points I'm, I'm going to take with me, but the main one is that uh, um, new insight of what other, these other resources are, are bringing to the table. If you're interested in taking the TEKS course, you can contact your state administrative agency. 
which is typically within the state's Homeland Security or Emergency Management Agency. The state administrative agency will then make the request to ODP. If the state doesn't require that you, that you do that, then a point of contact can contact TEKS or one of the other consortium members directly for a course and schedule it within a six-month period. The hosting agencies can also do their part to help create awareness and get more students involved. We've uh, created flyers with the announcement of uh, the prerequisites for the class, what the class hopes to accomplish, uh, the dates in the, in, of the class, and distributed those through the local emergency management offices, through uh, points of contact that the Planning Council has, through the uh, Regional Domestic Security Task Force, uh, to try to get the word out there uh, the best we can. Students who have already taken MGT 313 recommend it and encourage others to participate in the course. It's a must. We cannot continue to do our jobs without this training, without these courses. You don't take these courses and you don't get on board with, with what's going on. You're just on the, on the, on the edges and, and you really can't contribute. MGT 313 may be enough for some students, but others will want to go the next step. At TEKS, we now offer an advanced uh, incident management course called Management 314, which is done in-house at College Station, and it takes what we do in this course and it expands it into four uh, very intensive exercises using Unified Command. And we bring folks in to College Station at no cost to them. We put them up, we feed them, and they go through four days of very intense training and it has received pretty much rave reviews. In the next edition of ComNet, we'll take you to the Teeks Training Center at College Station, Texas for a more detailed look at the enhanced course. I intend to take a as many of these future courses as I can possibly take um, because this definitely is, is a tool that's going to save lives. Now, since this course is sponsored by the Office for Domestic Preparedness, all training and course materials are free to eligible jurisdictions. If you'd like some more information on this TEKS training course or any of the agencies featured in this program, visit our website or write to us. The address is ComNet, P.O. Box 13489, St. Petersburg, Florida, 33733. And while you're on the NTPI website, be sure and sign up to take the online test for CEUs. Also, you can help ensure that we're meeting your learning needs by completing the evaluation form. And just a reminder, our next ComNet will air Wednesday, February the 22nd at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And be sure to join us for live response on January the 25th at 2 p.m. Eastern, where we will discuss the Metropolitan Medical Response System. Thanks again for viewing, and we'll see you next time on ComNet.